Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be making a start, the very least, on my review of In the Jingle Jangle Jungle by Joel Guion, keeping time with the Brian Jonestown Massacre. So the Brian Jonestown Massacre are one of my favourite bands. Um, Joel Guion plays percussion, tambourine and stuff in, in the group. And uh, yeah, this is actually a pre-publication uh, copy. Uh, it's going to be published the 29th of February 2024 by White Rabbit Press, and hopefully I'll be having a chance to uh, chat to Joel as well. So, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts on racing at the end. I will say I'm only about a third, a bit less than a third of the way in it, into it at the moment. So um, you're going to get the start and then I will catch up with you later on with more. Dane reads. So the blurb. The future classic psychedelic memoir from Joel Guion, tambourine playing frontman of one of the great contemporary court cool American rock and roll bands, the Brian Jonestown Massacre. That's what we got. Uh, dedication to come. So uh, we, we start like, you know, with his early life and him moving to uh, San Francisco uh, and he goes uh, to try and get his first job. Um, and so the very week I turned the legal age of 18, I raced excitedly through the black darkness like a newborn baby turtle towards the blazing eternal flame of freedom lit by the beats and the hippies. Um, and he tries to get his first job at this strip club uh, with this guy called uh, Jim Mitchell and uh, it doesn't go too well. Um, so he goes, a few months later I was standing on a corner waiting for a crosswalk light when I happened to glance into a San Francisco Chronicle newspaper vending machine. Mitchell Brothers O'Farrell Theatre Murder, exclaimed the headline. Artie Mitchell was shot and killed by brother and business partner Jim Mitchell during a drug fueled And uh, he talks about a big, big earthquake uh, hitting. Uh, it was kind of the pre-internet days, but there was still this fake news. Someone was running around screaming, the Bay Bridge has collapsed. Um, someone else is saying, uh, this is just the pre-shock, they say the real one is coming, the real one is still coming. And he thinks, fuck this. I marched over to nearby Washington Square Park and sat cross-legged in the direct dead centre of the grass where I was finally, and for the first time, out of reach of any potential toppling structures. Soon night fell, and the only lights in the entire city came from the many circling overhead helicopter spotlights. With a city-wide power outage, you could actually see a full sky of stars shining brightly, further adding to the oddity of the entire situation. I hunkered down on my newly claimed chunk of park property until finally dozing off late into the night, still sitting up but with my head down in my lap. Nevertheless, I was restfully comfortable in the knowledge I was safely in one of the few places I knew this whole city couldn't just fall on top of me. And uh, yeah, the BJM early, in, well, Anton was still leading the band, but it was like an early, early gig for them. Um, they were playing on the roof of the Spaghetti Western restaurant on Lower Hyde Street. A friend of theirs had access to it from their bedroom window next door, and so they were going to just set up the gear and play without permits or permission. And it was their let it be moment. So he talks about the first time he, uh, Anton asked him to play some maracas or something. And um, he goes, That night I discovered that maracas were actually harder to play than they looked. When spontaneously shaken without a sense of time, they changed from being a Latin percussion instrument synonymous with 60s beat groups into a useless baby's rattle. To find the method forced me into a concentration that when mixed with rum and black shades gave an outward appearance of disengaged nonchalance. I found the key to timing wasn't by playing them from an outside perspective, not by trying to imagine hitting on something or finessing an outward method, but playing them from the inside. It was the unseen beads within that had to be in time with the rest of the instruments. The goal was to learn how to feel the inside, not play it, to to be what it is to be inside only without thinking about what it is to be it. And um, he says, musicians ironically are often not the grooviest bunch when it comes to money. Um, and he's talking about kind of the history of the tambourine. He does mention Bez, um, mostly because he's the public's only point of reference in the 90s music world. He says, uh, while I certainly enjoy the party mission aspect of them, it's pretty clear BJM aren't paying attention to that kind of music. I also don't dance on stage. Oh yeah, and Liam Gallagher from Oasis plays a tambourine too. But to my eye, he's just wanted something to do during the many guitar solos. Um, but he says before that, by the beginning of the 70s, a tambourine was something that could appear in any band member's hand at any given time during a performance. But by the mid 70s, it was pretty much just down to Stevie Nicks and Paul McCartney's wife, Linda, who only played it as an excuse to be on stage with her husband. This resulted in her single-handedly destroying the credibility of the instrument as an on-stage proposition for generations to come. And with the exception of a handful of fleeting here and there's, the tambourine disappeared from public view. There's a pretty badass uh, fly here from, uh, it's when, the BJM supported Oasis. Uh, it says, let's see. Uh, I saw the huge Oasis tour bus parked in front of the club from two blocks away. The debut Oasis album, Definitely Maybe, was now just two weeks old. And as I predicted, the band's popularity had exploded. The gig was now an oversold hot ticket that suddenly overnight could have been bumped up to somewhere triple the size of this 350 capacity club. And um, 
they can't find Jeff, the guitarist. And we get this little passage, which is interesting because it just shows you sort of what does, what's happening with the scene. We'll just have to play with that third guitar until he gets here, Anton says without irony. Matt points towards the corridor to the pool room. Well, I just saw Justine from Elastica playing pool with Damon from Blur over there. Maybe we should ask one of them to play with us, he says in his half morose, half kidding way. Somewhat bizarrely, Blur and Pulp were also on tour together promoting their new albums and had played across town at Bimbo's the night before. Then earlier this afternoon, local radio station Live 105 had the supposed rival bands Oasis and Blur in the studio together for a double interview. For one weekend in 1994, San Francisco was the Britpop centre of the world. And um, here's a little passage I want to share with you. This is, uh, I mean, the BJM are kind of known for their occasional fights. Um, Quite often it's Anton, the, the principal songwriter, singer-songwriter, you know, lashing out at somebody who's not doing their job properly, or at least what in his eyes is properly. Um, but this here is between Joel and uh, Matt, Matt Hollywood. Also, it has a reference to the documentary Dig, which uh, features the Dandy Warhols and the Brian Jonestown Massacre. It's directed by, I think, Andy Timonen. And actually, I think the 30th anniversary of that is coming out soon. I want to say the 30th, something like that. Um, but yeah, cracking documentary. If you're into music documentaries, you need to watch that. Anyway, luckily, or at least it seemed at first, the bar does so well that night, they gave us a bottle of whiskey to celebrate the healthy turnout and performance. Then, half a bottle later, outside in the parking lot, Matt suddenly snaps because he doesn't think I'm listening to what he is saying, or I'm acting like his opinion doesn't matter, or maybe both. He pushes me and suddenly I'm drunkenly wrestling someone who isn't playing. We are both whack amped up on the biker crank we've been snorting piles of, and the whiskey has served as the rocket fuel to launch us both straight out to planet Andromeda. We drunkenly roll around in the parking lot while Dave D, our manager, chooses to film us killing each other rather than managing this situation. What he catches on camera would later go on to be the one and only shot in Dig, not filmed by the documentary filmmakers. It was that good. I get Matt down and climb on top of him, then using my weight to hold his arms down so he can't hit me, I plead, Matt, you are my friend. We should not be fighting. I'm going to get up now so we can figure this out. I cautiously push off him, crouch backwards a few steps, then get down on my knees. He's writhing back and forth on the pavement with his hands over his face. Then I spread both my arms out as wide as they will go until my hands are fanning out behind my back and close my eyes. Matt, if you really want to do it, then just do it. Kill me right here, baby. As I stick my chin out and wait, I play this out in my head while Matt simply comes over and sits down beside me for a bonding session that renews our vows as brothers. I was that fucked up. Instead, what happens is whacked out whiskey wasted Matt goes into such a football style wind up kick that it even includes a run up step and he kicks me right in the face as hard as he can. So, we learn a little bit about um, the third Brian Jones Sound Massacre album release of that particular year. I can't remember what year it was, I want to say it was like 96. Um, uh, and it's the year that Thank God for Mental Illness got released, which has a photo of Joel on the cover. But there's some um, interesting stuff here, and I like the quote that he mentions as well. Uh, looking at the CD cover of the third BJM album release this year, there I am on the cover, pictured in close-up while whacked out of my skull and with a bloody mouth doing my best Christopher Lee as Dracula. As Greg begins filling in Anton, everyone flops around his copious amount of living room throw pillows while I drop at the kitchen table and sit flipping through all the inlay booklet band photos and read the liner notes for the first time. There's even one of my quotes inside, if you can't dig it you ain't got no shovel. And they end up going to uh, Timothy Leary's house. Um, uh, Ondi, who directed Dig, the documentary, said, A bunch of people have been living there since he died last month because the rent's paid through until the day after tomorrow. Um, and so, yeah, the last thing to ever happen at Timothy Leary's house was the Brian Jones sound massacre playing in his backyard. Uh, Timothy Leary being an important figure because he helped to popularise LSD. And yeah, he's living in this um, like warehouse, basically, where drugs are being manufactured and all kinds of shady shit's going on. Um, and he's discovered that they're like under surveillance and he tries to tell the people he lives with and they're sort of not particularly interested. Um, and we get this great line. I go back to my room having just self-diagnosed myself as suffering from both paranoia and reality simultaneously. And I love this name he has for beers as well. So he writes, and this is the morning after the big old fight at uh, the Viper Room, um, which is caught in the Dig documentary. It's the bit where um, Anton goes, he broke my sitar, motherfucker, which is one of my favorite bits. And then he's, he gets asked where, um, where the blood on his hands is from, and he says from people's faces. Anyway, um, the following morning I awake to the sound of Matt cracking open a beer can, or as I like to call it, an aluminium rooster. And we get a reference to The Wizard of Oz, which I enjoyed as I've been reading all of the, the Oz books. 
As we pull out of Sacramento Station, I'm no longer sad about leaving San Francisco. I will return someday, and for good, no matter how impossible it seems from where I'm sitting now. But like in The Wizard of Oz, I had almost lost my way by falling asleep in the poppy field. Now I was wide awake and back on the road. This would by no means mark the recovery into sobriety section of the story, as my days of being a partying explorer are to this day far from over. But from now on, I would be officially dialing it down from speed freak to just a freak. The book gets kind of self-referential at times here and there, but it's done in such a way that I enjoy it. Um, they almost, uh, Joel and, and, who is it, Joel and Matt, and I don't know if anyone else is in it, uh, but they almost get involved in an accident we get. Soon after, Matt and I were cruising up Glendale Boulevard with Brad in his 50s Ford Thunderbird when suddenly the engine just dropped dead and we found ourselves coasting backwards towards a blind curve because the brakes had also gone out with the engine. By the thickness of the remaining book pages in your hands, we obviously survived, but unfortunately the Thunderbird did not and was taken away by Towhurst to an auto pick and pull where it was feasted upon by scavengers. Then Peter's van also died or he sold it. I like, can't remember everything, man. Uh, I like this little reference to Dungeons and Dragons, but it also shows how like Joel has this kind of, I wouldn't want to call it, wouldn't call it rambling, but he has this writing style that's very idiosyncratic. And like he goes off at one point, uh, he thought that Anton was being led by his moustache. Like, he had this moustache going on and uh, he wondered whether the moustache was the reason why Anton was acting weird. But anyway, so although Dave D and his van were once again on main transportation in and out of Atwater Village, during this week's studio recording session, we were able to add Greg Shaw and Ondi and David as possible ride options to and from or hither and fro, depending on what time dimension you are now reading this in, or if you're some kind of Dungeons and Dragons nerd or something. You'd be surprised at how many people you know secretly are. I was. We get this studio engineer, uh, or a guy who must be the studio engineer, um, and we, ha we get this little passage which I just thought was fun. So hey my friend, okay this guy does the sound of the troubadour right, I told him I was doing a session with you guys and he tells me that a couple weeks ago a tambourine of yours came down out of the rafters and bounced off this guy's head on stage while he was in mid guitar solo mind you, okay, and he doesn't know what just happened and is looking around like what the fuck. And my friend is just laughing because these guys are like hair metal dudes and very serious. And my friend had seen you throw that thing in the air like two weeks before and it never coming down. Until these guys like shake it from the rafters and it comes down like a thunderbolt from the 60s rock gods. As if hair metal guys didn't have far enough to fall already after Nirvana hit. A tambourine of all things. Man, does it get any better? And I enjoyed the beginning of this chapter here, the Marlboro Man vs. the Man. Because bear in mind I've been reading on the exercise bike at the gym. And he says... Uh, we have some gym girls, basically, and I was obviously surrounded by gym girls while I was doing this. After the big party, our address became of note to various people, including yet another pair of girls who showed up every few days, always wearing workout gym clothes, who just wanted to hang out in the living room and snort cocaine. Matt and I would usually serve as hosts for these drop-ins, and I'd learned through repeated nose reps that I don't really like coke all that much. This is a key factor in why my brain still functions enough to even be writing all of this today. What was funny about these two is they really were coming directly from the gym, still in their tight nylon tanks and capris like this was a part of the training routine. It all stays pretty in innocent and that's okay because I like it when random weirdness remains faithful to its original state and we also get lots of drugs that I keep hoping I will suddenly like because well I'm supposed to. We were waiting for the day when the cougar alky ladies and the workout cokehead girls would randomly meet but unfortunately this head-to-head -head matchup never occurred. So there's another bit of like uh, breaking up the, the fourth wall which I think Joel does pretty well um, I like referencing the fact that this is a book you know. It's stinking hot as Santa Monica Boulevard bumper to bumper traffic spanning as far as the eye can see. I should feel liberated. Elise had given me and Matt her old piece of shit car, which actually still works, but only until the end of this paragraph. And I thought this was interesting about how you miss things when you're on tour, because you've always got to get to the next place. Um, so uh, we get Dallas is just Dallas again, and next we're going to backtrack to New Orleans where Mardi Gras is in two days. But unfortunately for us, by that time we will be waking up in Florida. No kaleidoscopic massive explosions in colours, sound and revelry, the floats and the music coming from every direction, the costumes, the cops, and the almighty happy plague of beads crisscrossing the air in all directions. But rather when we arrive, it's the calm before the litre-sized hurricane cocktails hit. 
Today, many of the locals must be charging up their liver batteries because Bourbon Street is at a stumble still as the Brian Jonestown Massacre members walk it as if astronauts in a lost utopian Atlantis party zone on another planet. The grey rain has washed it all down because the festivity gods are cleaning everything up for the crowds that we will narrowly be missing. One thing about hard touring is the amount of near misses there are when you've got to be getting onto the next town every single day. And just one final thing I want to show, which is a fun little joke. You kind of need to know the Brian Jonestown Massacre to get this joke, but still... Um, how many BJM members does it take to screw in a light bulb? One, Anton, duh. But if he's going to screw it in live, then six to eight, depending on whether or not there is a keyboardist this time, or if we are in between third guitar players. So yes, uh, all in all, that's all I tabbed out to share with you from the, in the Jingle Jangle Jungle. Um, there is a lot of overlap between Dig and this. It's basically, in many parts, probably the middle third of it is Joel's side of what happens in dig um so if you've seen that documentary you'll be familiar with a lot of the stuff here and um, there's a lot of great insights as well as you can tell it's also really interesting to see that it's written in joel's like style you hear his voice when you're reading it you know it'd be really good to get an audio book of him reading it i think um but yeah i probably gave it a 4.5 out of 5 the only thing that i think it's missing really is a bit of an update of where he's where he was at between well, after about 1999, because um, it kind of tapers off when he, when you know, I guess he left the band then. Um, but as far as I understand it, he's touring with them again these days. And um, yeah, I would just like to know a bit more about what happened after the uh, late 90s. But still, very good read, especially if you're a fan of modern music, if you're a fan of rock music, and especially if you're a fan of the Brian Jones Sound Massacre, you got to read it. So there we have it, that's what I made of In the Jingle Jangle Jungle by Joel Gion. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.